Welcome I back, Inebriate. <laughs> it's always a lady. It's kind of creepy, too. Yeah, she does not sound pleasant. No, no, it's in... It, She's got the kind of the uh, aliens, you have one minute to reach minimum safe distance voice. And why do they make her British? Like, in every, you know, initiating self-destruct announcement, it always seems like they're British. Because I wouldn't trust any, like non if it was just like if it sounded like someone down the road in the united states of america who just had some country voice i'd be like no <laughs> when i make a sci-fi film it's going to be a southern draw being like the, the ship will explode in five minutes but it's going to yeah, be you got like one minute to get the hell out of here because <laughs> this shit's going to blow like I would, move. Kind of, I would just stand there and smile and feel comforted <laughs> <laughs> and then i would die <laughs> so listeners that voice is uh christine um yeah you are talking to christine yeah uh so in order to get my kind of like head in the right space whenever i have a musician on i usually spend like the half hour ahead of time listening to some of their music and i was doing so and in the in the press release they refer to your music as scuzz punk but i feel like you know, Big Shot to me sounds like a, a, a dance track and then like low paid runway models, kind of like a bat. Like, how do you classify your music or do you I, I hate asking that because I don't like to do that. But I feel like for people who are unfamiliar, it gives them kind of like a frame of reference. How would you put a frame of reference about what it is you do? Uh, it's really hard because the I, I really let the as you were saying, like you, you do these podcasts unscripted. You have no idea where this is going to go, right? No, none. Zero. Uh, you get a feel for it. You run with it. And, and whatever particular fucking mood you're in today is the way you're going to portray and deliver your voice and, and carry on. So I feel the same way with the music. I don't really have a, a script for a genre, I guess. Uh, or kind of, but I do, I guess it's always fallen into a realm of uh, electronic music. Mm -hmm. Like early on, it was all, you know, produced electronically, not like crazy crash craft work, kind of mad electronic shit, but like it, it was electronically based, you know? Yeah. So we would throw it in that can and then, but I would bring in drums and things. And I, I guess I don't, Really, I've never really been able to understand how to explain it to people. Or, and I'm not a big fan of a label or a genre because it traps me. Right. It, tra it traps you. It, it, it puts your brain and you associate it with this and boom, boom, boom. And there it is, packaged up, ship it out, you know? So I guess a friend of mine was listening to the new shit of the new album, which is quite different than the old shit. Mm -hmm. And they said, uh, which kind of I liked a lot, they said, I can hear so many references to things you may have experienced in your life, and I can't put a finger on one of them. Oh, that's and cool. I, I felt that that was really, I was very touched by that, like Della Reese and an angel. And I, um, I felt that that was a good way of kind of, playing with that idea of where this is coming from. It's very influenced by many things. It's a gumbo of music. and But it does take an electronic soundscape. Oh, my God. Music gumbo. I love that. Fuck yeah. Gumbo that's, is the best. Yeah, but like that that's a great... That should be a genre, music gumbo. And it's Yeah, like, I, my genre is music gumbo, and it has... If you don't season it properly, it fucking sucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's true. It's like you get bands that kind of get pigeonholed and then if they want to do something different, then they have to like either rebrand as a different lineup yeah. or get criticized for it. But then like bands like yourself or um, what jumps to mind is Ween. I mean, oh, I love Ween. Every Ween song is like a completely different genre than the absolutely. Before. And there's a, a, a really wonderful playfulness about that and a very dangerous quality too um i i love that reference and i think the thing with ween is they were two idiots having a lot of fun and i guess and doing, a lot, doing a lot of drugs under <laughs> the kitchen sinks and things and and i think 
they 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 allow themselves to, to remain in this realm where they were allowed to have that fun and i really i i really appreciate that and it gives the artist the creative people so much more freedom yeah I, I mean, I, I, mean understand, I, I understand in the world we live in and yeah and capitalistic fires that burn they need to know what we're doing so they can sell it right but i mean i i do love that because i feel like all creative processes start as play yes, and, and, and and that's kind of like you, you don't you don't know where it's going to go and to me that's kind of the exciting part and if you try to like put it in a structure it becomes predictable it becomes boring it becomes you know, like even the person doing it, it's kind of like you know this is repetitive i don't want to do this anymore so i really love that kind of letting it become what it it wants to be opposed to trying to like fit it into some sort of framework that someone else is like, this is what you are. Yeah. And it, it also becomes very dangerous for the person creating the work because when they have been classified or put into a genre or whatnot, you, you would end up creating content for your audience instead of for yourself. Mm -hmm. You're, you're making something to fit. It seems to me that you would begin to, make material to remain in that genre um if, unless you had the the hoo-ha to get the fuck out of that genre and change it all up but therefore risk damaging your career you know um things like that and those are just terrible traps i would never want to be in those traps you know yeah it, i mean it, it is that kind of you know i've talked with a lot of creative people in, in all fields and it's that when i mean it, literally that's how inebriate started it, is it started as part of um there's this movement called drink and draw that was coming out of la and it was artists who were like do you remember when we used to do this and it was fun and not a uh -huh. job and it's like if it when you get to a certain you know metallica level it's got to feel like a job because you're you're spending so much time on the road you're spending so much time in these incredibly expensive like recording studios and there's people that have to make a profit off of you in order to justify spending that and i, I mean i really like the playfulness of, of your work thank you and I, I mean i think like I, I spoke to this woman i know she's very old and very on fire and never stopped she's a creative person uh, Mich her name is Michelle Lamy and she's really spectacular and she's really vibrant and just bangs it out and she was telling me once that she was traveling and had to go to this country to do something and I said oh Michelle I said were you there for business or pleasure and she took a big fucking long drag of her cigarette and she's French and she inhaled it and she blew it out. And she goes, darling, business is pleasure and pleasure is business. And I really, when you said job, I really think it's important to maintain the quality that your job or your business should, must be pleasurable. And the pleasure is also has to have some business up in it so it can continue to sustain itself. So I kind of try to stay away from that idea that what I'm doing and what I'm creating with these other musicians, it is a job. It is, it is business, but it, it, it must be pleasure. They must, they must relate to each other in that way, or you're going to just run into terrible things and, and you're going to become a corporate, corporate animal, you know? Um, what is it? Grace Jones, a, cor a corporate cannibal. She has a song like that, and we just start to eat ourselves. Yeah, and, and it's interesting is because, like, even if you're not in a creative field, you know, I used to work retail, and I left because I'm like, I'm I'm not doing this to myself. It, it just became, it literally, I was getting chest pains. I was miserable, and it's just like, I'd rather make less money and be happy then try to, you know, keep up with the Joneses and suffer. Like, to me, there's no point to that. Yeah, it just takes some work and you have to be able to sustain that energy and sustain that mindset. And that is quite a tricky uh, game to play. Yeah, but and it, it, it's, I work harder now, but it doesn't feel like work, you know? Mm-hmm. 
then it's biz- then you're doing business and pleasure. You're doing it right. Nice. Um, so the other thing that I wanted to ask you was I really dug the big shot video. Um, I thought it was like visually really stunning. Now, do you, how much um, say or control do you have in making videos like that? Are you oh, interested 100%. in that sort of thing? Yeah, hundred percent. Those videos, most all of the videos I've made up till now, except for one, were all made with my uh, collaborative partner PJ Raval, and mm-hmm. he's a filmmaker. And we were both in Austin, Texas, and we just developed a really strong collaborative relationship. I call him my partner, not my partner. <laughs> and um, me and him found such joy. He he was able to escape the world of the you know of documentary film work and the structures and and the rules and regulations of that realm and kind of go wild through me and i was able to kind of escape the madness of my just creative realm and get a little structured and start to be able to uh you know see a pictorial representation of the mad crap that's in my brain so uh it was a wonderful cocktail and we just have enjoyed it very much and i'm glad you bring out big shot because big shot to me was one of my it is one of my favorite songs and also one of my favorite videos because it was a kind of a peak in our journey where we really understood what was going on and there was a very powerful narrative that was coming through uh it was a very exciting time and we had it was the first time we really really um did a production of a video. We had access to a place through um, the University of Texas where PJ is also a professor. Mm -hmm. So we were able to use a very large room for the first time. We were able to use a set designer to come in and build that room we're in, the bedroom. Yeah. Uh, We built the tree. We made it snow. We hung my dick from a fucking ceiling where it hurt so bad. (laughs) Um, And I was just like, get me down. And PJ's like, no, do it again. And I'm like, fuck you. And then we get the best shots. Um, and it was a really magical time when we were, we somehow, we would raise some money. And I think it was so, we did a lot for nothing, you know, and we had a few wonderful people around us who would volunteer time and things. And, um, and that's, to me, that's one of the great things. And we're kind of like in one of those moments now with our company where, um, you know, so just some amazing people are coming out of the woodwork and want us to, like they, they see our vision, they see where things are going and they want us to succeed because, you know, some of it's, you know, uh, it's helping themselves, you know, if they help us, it, it helps them in the long run. But, you know, there, you know, we have videographers coming out that want to help us shoot pr- promo videos of what we're doing. And, you know, it, it's, it's just this really interesting it, infection i guess when if, if you're kind of on the right track then it, you just kind of draw the right people to you and it, it becomes yeah. like it's so much fun it's how it works and of course you know everyone should be paid <laughs> and of course there, yeah, yeah, yeah. When it's there it's there and at that stage of the game we had just started to get there um it, it was really exciting it was an exciting time and exciting people involved and and yeah i, I like i very much like that whole song and video and chapter of life but the videos all of the videos are very they're little movies and and they're very special to me and to to pj too uh so normally i don't plan questions ahead of time but in reviewing the email that was sent out um by your pr it said you work with faith no more faith no more is one of my all-time favorite bands oh that's Um, right what was it like to work with them? Um, do you have any interesting Faith No More stories? Well, I mean, I'm friends with the keyboardist, Roddy Bottom. Yep. And Roddy's a fucking amazing, one of the most amazing people in the world. I was, I was, um, I was talking to someone who was uh, kind of like a shrink person, a guy person. And they were like, okay, to help you like deal with traumatic situations or something, they kind of make you choose these um, people in your life who will some will give you strength some will give you protection like people you view and i i chose roddy for i think it was for knowledge to guide me through a knowledgeable experience he's really smart he's really matter of fact and he's really got that kind of like surfer voice like hey man what's up like he's just (laughs) 
He's so incredible and he's really generous. And we met in P-Town and became fast friends um, years and years ago. And then when Faith No More, they came back together and began touring. And I was like, Roddy, let us open for you, me and my two dancers. Yeah. And, and I was pressing him. I'm like, it would be ridiculous. Let us open for you for these, for these couple of fir their first US shows. And um, I, I love Faith No More. I grew up, grew up well, my younger years, I listened to them a lot and I very much enjoyed their content, their videos, all of it. And Roddy was a, such a kind of a joy. And I never knew Roddy was a homo. And the fact that he came out of the closet, especially he came out when they were touring with Guns N' Roses. They were like, you can't do this. And he was like, fuck you. Oh, wow. Because that was a came, while ago. Yeah, he came out then. And that was dangerous times. And then the dude from, um, what's his name? Rob Halford from... Judas Priest, yeah. Yeah, he came out around the same time. There's a there's always an argument as who did it first. Um, and um, we did. We went on tour with them. And it was quite an experience it was the only time i've ever been in a very large room where half the crowd was booing and half the crowd was cheering and you got this amazing soundscape like this hurricane of sound was like ooh yeah ooh yeah and i was like <laughs> what the fuck and uh mike Patton, he's real great and he um you know he said the reason i agreed to have y'all open for us he said, because after all these years, I wanted to see if our audience was still fucking crazy. <laughs> and I was like, well, I hope we answered the question for you. Because, you know, he wanted to put something up in front of his audience and see what the, how they reacted to us. And I was happy to be his little stinky guinea pig. That's awesome. Yeah. They're wonderful. They're wonderful uh, fellas. And um, it was quite an honor to, to open for them. And... They put plastic, their, their stage was covered in carpet for that yep. tour, like white beige carpet. And so I'm the I'm a very dirty person. I pull things out of my butt. I'm covered in bruisey makeup, everything. And they, they put plastic on everything on the stage when we would come out and then they would remove it when they performed, which I thought was really cute too. Yeah. They thought, they thought I'd shit the rug. <laughs> <laughs> um, I always thought that, um, you know, I, I was... Faith No More, I've seen a few times. Uh, Mr. Bungle, I always thought their theatrics yeah. were, were great. Um, they always had something cool and unexpected. Um, and I, I, I like that extra step when, you know, it's not just the band walks out on stage. I think, you know, you know Rob Zombie, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, Marilyn Manson, all these people that like make it a show. And yeah, it, it is a show. It's theater. Yeah. Um, if you don't realize that, then you're you're crazy. You're not enjoying it to the fullest extent of the what you can do with it. Um. So we're right down. We're actually kind of like across the bay from P Town. Um, I love it there. It is so cool. Um, for our listeners who don't know what P Town is, is Provincetown. Uh, it is. Yeah, it's the, on the very tip of Cape Cod. Yeah, you cannot get further down Cape Cod, and if nope. you drive there, you're out of your mind because it takes. I can probably get to New Hampshire faster than I can get to P Town. Yeah, a lot of my friends drive there from New York. It's like a lot. Yeah, you, you got to take the ferry. <laughs> um, I love the ferry. It, it's just such a it's such a, a cool, chill place, and it's it's weird. Like our part of Massachusetts is very. Massachusetts as a whole is considered very like liberal and democratic, but South shore is very much not. So it's this weird little bastion of coolness at the end of Cape Cod. That... It's the, it's the Valhalla of gays. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. I think it's just, it's so wonderful. And it's very Edward Gorey, witchy and cottages and bicycles. I mean, John Waters spends his fucking summers there. If that tells you anything. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh yeah, he's there, and and just uh, so many wonderful writers. Tennessee Williams used to swing his dick around there, and wonderful writers, and it's just a very magical place. It's very rich, and and some culture from some very uh, interesting people, and I've I've met wonderful people there who are very family to me now. It's it's, it's quite a place. It's quite a place. That's fantastic. Um, yeah, I I love. Um... Plymouth is finally now starting to get 
on board. I don't know. Up to date is probably the better term. But um, during, was it 2021? Yeah, 2021, Boston Pride was still kind of on hiatus. Um, I think Provincetown was was kind of low key. So, you know, the local people around here started um, the Plymouth Pride Festival. And it it's only been two years, but it's already grown to like a huge extent. And the a lot of people in town have accepted it with open arms, which is great. And yeah, it's important to have them, and they always grow once you start them up. You just got to start up the old engine. Yeah, I, I, my my favorite part was um, they asked us to record our podcast, so we did that. But um, so I brought my youngest along and I said, "Hey, do you you know do you want to come?" And they were so excited, and it was really like a great bonding moment for us um, as they're kind of you know maturing and, and growing into the person that they they should be want to be. How yeah, in this that? mad in this mad fucking world. Yeah, and it's crazy, you know. It's just it was one of the I think one of the more serious conversations we ever had. Where I'm like, just you know, I just want you to be happy. I really don't care. Yeah, what path you choose, or if you choose one and then change your mind, I don't. It doesn't affect me in any way, shape, or form. It's just just be happy. It will when they start putting wigs on and pulling balloons out their butt like I did to my parents. <laughs> Uh, the wigs I'm fine with. Uh, the balloons, I don't have to be there for that. <laughs> exactly. That's what I tell, that's what I tell people uh, close to me who don't really want to see it. I'm like, you don't have to um, understand it. You just have to support it and you never have to see it. Yeah. But how, I mean, this is, you know, trying times for, for people that don't quote unquote fit the norm. How, how do you deal? I mean, I'm assuming you get hate from somewhere. Um, Mostly myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I mean, and my cat. I get, I, I get, uh, I get that entirely. No, um, I think, I think, um, you know, there's different ways to deal with the confrontation. And, and I was asked this in an interview yesterday, someone, um, Someone just said, you know, what do you think of bullies? Just flat out. What's, what's a bully to you? Or what do you think of anger? What is anger to you? And, and I think with the times we're in, there's a fine line, which I like to try to hold on to is I really try to, if someone comes at me in an angry way or tries to shut me down, I don't mean like attack me physically, but in those cases, I'll just go ape shit on you and grab anything I can and rip it off of you. But <laughs> um, I feel like when someone, you know, is, is coming at you in, in a social realm or uh, angry way, I don't know. I always try to, I fucking try to first think of them as a kid and remember that they were once a kid and they probably just got fucked up real bad by their fucking parents or their environment. And that's the first thing I try to do to soften myself before, instead of, I don't like blowing up. I don't like tempers and, you know, people who rail and flail quickly. I don't, I don't, I don't abide by that. So, uh, and I don't allow it around my, my, me and my work and my people. So, um, I think the biggest thing is having people around you, like trying to stay away from isolation, which is hard to do and, and what we've been through for the last couple of years. So it's really trying to, to not fall into a deeper isolation, technologically speaking, in the realms that we live in now. And also to make effort to go out and to be part of uh, culture and shows and art and uh, gatherings and trying to really stay in those uh, rooms but instead of running out and leaving, going back to your couch for Netflix, which is like the way we've been doing for the past three years, some of us, many of us. Um, and then, you know, like, I don't know if you've ever heard of Jane County, the amazing uh, musician and trans whack no. track motherfucker. Um, you do? You know Jane? No, 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 I don't. Yeah, they're, they're pretty, they were in the Warhol days and, they were this old hick and um, transitioned. To, it was Wayne County, transitioned to Jane County and wrote a book called Man Enough to Be a Woman. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jane always talked about wrecking, like wrecking the streets. And, and Jane and her friends had this horrible block downtown that was a big, big block, city block. And it was bad. Like people would really fuck with you. And they would all dress up big time, lady time. And they'd be in a car and they'd, 
pull up to the curb. And each one of them would have to get out of the car and walk around the entire block of that building and get back to the car. And they call it wrecking. They go wreck that street because they would do it to let everyone on that sidewalk know that they also lived there and that they were, that sidewalk was theirs too. And I think when people come at me, uh, people don't understand what's going on and they get angry and try to shut it down or fuck it up. You kind of also have to get that mentality and understand that that sidewalk is yours. That space is yours. The city is also mine. And if you have to make space for everybody and you have to fucking allow that in there. So I tend to just turn that on in my head and go wrecking and, uh, you know, walk that street and let those fuckers know that it's, it's mine as much as it is theirs. And if you don't respect it, then fuck off. I think that's, that's just great. And I, it's one of those, when you get someone who's really bigoted like that and then you like ask them, you know, how many trans people or, or, you know, whatever they're going on about people, do they personally know? And it's almost always zero. And it's that I'm, I feel like hate like that says more about the person who's hating than anyone else, because it's them feeling so uncomfortable because they haven't been exposed to it. And they, they're putting some sort of weird preconceived notion or, or their concern or, or God forbid, I don't know, they might like it too, you know? Yeah. It, it, exactly. It's that it's just, just, you know, I don't understand it because it's just like it, most of it doesn't even affect you at all. So who cares? Well, and keyword, God forbid, it's very, Oh deep. yeah, <laughs> I suppose it, that's true. It, yeah. The yeah. religion, the religion will guide that brain in a very rough way. So yeah. um, here we are with that. So yeah, there's a lot of factors that play into that shit. Um, and I think the the mentality of wrecking something is saying it's their sidewalk as much as it is mine is the right way to go. You're giving them space. They're giving you space. You're not saying, fuck off, get out of here, leave me alone, get off this. You know, it's like, right. well, we, we're kind of all in this fucking shit together. So you better, you're going to turn some dials and make some room. Mm -hmm. And um, people are very afraid to do that. And, um, People don't want to give a chance for that. So it's very tricky, but you know, it, it's better than a, it's like, it's better than a Titan against a Titan and just taking it down. Yeah. And I, I think that's sometimes what people they're, they're so used to seeing hostility towards them that the automatic thing is to be hostile back, which I really liked when you said, you know, you try to think that, you know, that, that they were a kid who was probably screwed up by their parents or, or religion or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Give yourself a minute, just a minute to kind of try to cushion that blow you're about to deliver. Um, so the new album is called Midnight Fuck Train, right? Mm -hmm, that's correct. Fuck with two K's. <laughs> that's how I spell. Okay. So that's, I, I am very dyslexic. So, uh, that uh, stuff like that tends to screw me up because I'm like, I definitely know that's wrong. Um, no, but I, I, um, I, I got off. My brain jumped. Um, oh, you're, you're talking about my new album. Yeah. New album. And um, the single off it is Buku Morocco. Yeah. Buku Morocco. That was the first single we released. Yeah. And what was, where did that song come from? Like, was, um, was... I was in Hamburg, Germany. Yeah. And, I was with these dykes that I know, and we had just finished a really good run of a show. My pals Silky and Lex and Beth, and uh, they knew this dude from Morocco, and he was very fun. And I was talking to him at the last night of the festival. We were all ripped up, having a good time. And I said, oh, you're from Morocco? And he spoke French. And I was like, what the fuck? I was like, y'all speak French in Morocco? And I can do French. I've got a nice vocabulary. And then especially when I get liquor in me, I can really do it. <laughs> no, I, think, <laughs> I think I can. Yeah. And so we started parlaying in French, this and that. And then uh, we were laughing and I couldn't believe that he was just a Frenchman from Morocco. I didn't know shit. And so I was like, I'm going to write you a song. I'm going to write you a song called Puku Morocco. And it's pronounced Boku if you're going to do it properly, but I don't. This is how I do it. So uh, maybe two years after that experience, I wrote Buku Morocco. And uh, that's how most of my music comes about. It is, I'm, I, 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 I glean a lot off of touring. And uh, 
meeting people and I have little experiences like that that usually create the, the first spark of a song or a, a, a hook in my head uh, that works. And then usually I'll find a feeling or a situation that's going on in my life to round it out and fill up that little spark that, that kind of happened, you know? Um, traveling and touring and meeting people is very important to me because of that. It keeps, it keeps that engine going and the, the creative process kicking. So Bukumako is kind of a really good example of that, of, um, of a very ridiculous late night encounter in Hamburg that became a very assaulting, ridiculous song. Yeah, yeah, I love that you you say that meeting people is important. And I, growing up, was incredibly um, shy and reclusive. And it was well into my adulthood before I kind of forced myself out. And the more I get to meet people, the more, I don't know, I, I, I like it. And everyone has a story. And that's kind of what where the podcast come from and you know i get to to talk to and meet so many amazing people and, and it just exposes you to so many differing different opinions and people and it, it's just it's a really i think it's one of the, my favorite parts of doing this is just getting to talk to so many different people yeah it's a good thing cracks your head open yeah for sure i mean and like i was saying earlier it's it's harder to dislike someone when you actually get to sit down and have a conversation with them. Yeah. Or, or you can dislike them even more, even more. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Yeah. Um, that, that does happen. The other side of, that's the other side of the card and the coin there. So yeah. yeah. But you're at least taking a chance to sit down and dip in with them. And that's what most people don't do. Yeah. You know, everyone kind of likes to be isolated and comfortable. And there's something about putting yourself out there, being a little uncomfortable. Yeah. And the more you do it, you just kind of get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, so where can people go to get your album or find out where you're going to be on tour, all your social medias, all the, the corporate I mean, part of the, the podcast? Yeah, yeah. Most of the shit I use. The best thing I like to try to do is, I mean, I just communicate through that Instagram shit. That's the mm -hmm. main place that uh, you can find me and you can find my most up to date, any videos I have where I'm talking to you. It's the most direct bullet to your heart is the Instagram. Uh, I don't uh, parlay on Facebook anymore because I just don't want to. So, you know, 10 of my friends can get hit by an automobile and break their legs or adopt a puppy. And I won't know about it anymore. So, <laughs> um, I, uh, I, I, I'm, yeah, you can mainly find me on Instagram and, um, um, Oh, that's my cat. And, um, other than that, you just find me out on the road, but everything I post is there. I also have a website that I try to keep up to date with all that shit. And, um, yeah, and that's it. And then if you see me around New York City, I'll talk to you in your face and tell you about it. Are you on tour now or currently going or planning a tour? Planning, yeah. The, well, the album will come out on 11-11 this year. And because I'm working with a band now, I never have really done this. Uh, I've, I've toured alone. I've toured with two remarkable dancers. Usually I've, all of my touring in the past, I don't know, nine years, 10 years, um, I've usually toured with my remarkable dancers and now I'm, you know, changing and evolving or devolving. I don't know. And um, the band presents a, a very interesting challenge. So I'm trying to figure out the team and the tools I need to uh, bring that band to certain cities and places and, and how much of how much of the people will get of the band and how much the people will get of let's say me and my saxophone player you know mm -hmm. um so no rules no regulations just figuring it out and whatever we can afford but next year i plan to get the fuck back on the road in the spring and i plan to not stop nice yeah it's been a while uh, yeah, it's been a while for a lot of people. It's it's nice to see bands starting to tour again and uh, catching some shows. Okay. Um, so we're 
we've been doing this almost seven years uh 315 ish episodes and i've been that whole time i've never had a good way to close the podcast and so i've been kind of messing around with a few things and so i feel like lately i've been asking kind of uh weird questions so to close what is the primary ingredient in musical gumbo the primary ingredient in musical gumbo is mayonnaise. <laughs> <laughs> that is my favorite answer. And yeah, you that, asked me a weird question. I'm going to give you the right answer. I love it. I love it. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. And uh, we wish you the best of luck on your, your album and your future tour. And uh, for our listeners, we'll catch you guys again next week. All right. Thanks, Andy. And thanks for checking out the show today, listeners. Uh, If you enjoyed the content today, you can go over to patreon.com slash inebriart to support the show. You can join over there for just a few dollars a month and help us provide this fun content that you just checked out. You can also email us at inebriart.com with your questions, complaints, and concerns. Or you can find us on all social medias at inebriart or at inebriart6 on Instagram. And also don't forget to check out our other shows, Bar Talk Podcast, Old Colony Cast, Inebriart, and all the other shows on the Inebriart Network, which you can find at inebriart.com. Thanks again for listening.